Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 6. And I've entitled our Bible study today, Grace Triumphs Over Legalism. Grace Triumphs Over Legalism. And it's a two-part study just on this topic. But we're going to be in Acts 15 for a few more weeks as this is such a pivotal chapter in the book of Acts. Everything could have been derailed here if this issue that we're studying today would not have been resolved according to the heart of God. The simplicity of the gospel was under attack. And we're only talking about 20 years. By the time we get to Acts chapter 15, we're only about 20 years into the life of the early church. Within 20 years, there were already those wanting to undermine, wanting to infiltrate, if you will, with false teaching, and really attack the most significant part of the church, or one of the most significant parts of the church, and that is, how is a man, how is a woman saved? That's the question at hand here. Now, for our church here today, as you read through our website, If you go to that section on our website where our doctrinal statement is and our vision and the direction and why we exist, you'll come across this paragraph that should be very prominent there. We brought with us from California, Pastor Chuck Smith actually wrote it, and it becomes this bedrock of the ministry here. If this was all we had, uh, it would be very helpful for us in leading the church. And this is what he wrote, and I quote, Our supreme desire is to know Christ and to be conformed into his image by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not a denominational fellowship, nor are we opposed to denominations as such. Only their overemphasis of the doctrinal differences that have led to the division of the body of Christ. We believe that the only true basis of Christian fellowship is his agape love, which is greater than any differences we possess and without which we have no right to claim ourselves Christians, end quote. And just rereading it brings me such great comfort and confidence in the choices that we've made as a church towards simplicity in our living in and for Jesus Christ. We want things and work very hard to keep things simple here in the life of our fellowship. Keeping things simple and keeping our eyes focused on Jesus helps to alleviate so many problems that have plagued churches for centuries. And yet the enemy is really good at scattering false teaching and false teachers amongst true believers and true teaching. He loves confusion and he loves to get people distracted. The false teaching that was taking root in the early church here was this bondage of legalism or the requirement to continue on with works in order to be saved. It's burdensome, and it's heavy, and it's a trap. The trap of man-made religion. The trap of man-made traditions in order for you and I to be in a right relationship with God. People get really burned out on religion. Some of you have that testimony. Man-made religion. All of these barriers that exist that have been put there that you have to get through all these barriers in order to get to Christ. No, the Bible is very clear that any one of us can enter boldly into the throne room of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Any one of us can find a deep abiding relationship with Jesus that you open up the Bible, you read it, you repent of your sins, God welcomes you in. And people are getting ripped off today from the simplicity of Jesus. And we've made it a point to stay as simple as we can, to minimize rituals and ceremonies and rules and regulations, this heavy burden that comes. Now, in our statement that we read, there is a lot of division in the body of Christ over what we would say are non-essentials. It's important that we understand some things are worth fighting for. Absolutely taking a stand. They're non-negotiables. For example, the deity of Jesus Christ, his very nature, we're not messing around with that. That that, that is non-negotiable. We trust what Jesus said, how he demonstrated and revealed himself. That's a non-negotiable. The virgin birth of Christ, non-negotiable. Um, Whether we lift our hands when we're singing or not, that's negotiable. 
And people argue about that stuff. What songs we choose to use or all the little things, what color the carpet, is, what, what you name it, there's a lot of things that divide, but some things we must fight for. And that's where the early church is. There are things, most things we don't need to fight at at all. We, we just need to look at each other in agape love and just know that we're in fellow, we're true believers, we're in true fellowship. The agape love knits us together. And I think it's a word for us today to be reminded that we need to stop arguing about non-essentials. If there's anything Christians are good at, and I recognize that some might take this personal, if you take this personal, then I would just say, deal with it. Deal with it. You ready? Some things that sometimes the only things Christians are good at are fighting about things that don't matter. One amen. amen. And everyone on the radio is screaming at me right now, amen, brother. But if you're not careful, this will become your life. And you will waste a lot of energy getting involved in things that have no eternal value. And you might have the right argument, and you might have, and you might just be taking the word of God and pounding people into the ground with it, but you're not winning, any, any, you're not winning anyone over to the love of God. You're arguing about things that really don't matter, that all be sorted out at the end. If you're going to take a stand, take a stand for those things that are essential, but even then, take a stand in love, recognizing that you're dealing with another human being on the other end of this. Uh, even false teachers, even those that might be, well, but yeah, they're an enemy of the gospel. I know they're an enemy of gospel. And Jesus said that we're to pummel our enemies, right? Isn't that what it says? That pummel our enemies, destroy. No, that's not what the Bible says. Jesus gives us a counterintuitive approach to enemies, doesn't he? He says, love them. Love your enemies. As we turn to Acts 15, they're dealing with a very essential that we must take a stand on, and that is how is a person saved? There is only one way that a person is saved that can receive the forgiveness of their sins and be in right relationship with God. There are not two ways. There are not three ways. God has made this so simple. He has made this so simple that even a child can understand this. So to complicate it and to obfuscate it, I don't even know if that's a word, but like to, to make it all where you can't see, where to, to blind people's eyes from it, uh, you are going beyond the scriptures. Jesus made it very clear. You ready? He said this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, that pretty much covers them all, can come to the Father except through me, Jesus said. There is no other way. There is no other way for you and I to be saved. Not only is there only one way, but you also need to understand you must be saved. You must be saved. It's an essential in your life. It, to be reconciled to your creator, you and I, we must be saved. Jesus once again would say, no one's going to see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You need new life outside of yourself. You cannot save yourself. And I think of the room, you know, it can be divided into a lot of different ways. We can say that some of us have a really, really, really bad past, and God saved us from our past. We need to be saved. If you have a really, really bad present, you know, like you're just living in rebellion and separate from God, you must be saved. And those, you know, we, we agree with that. Like, of course, we look at someone and we think, man, that's what they need is what they really need is God, and you would be true. But also in the room among us today are very moral people. Very good people, like the society would say you're very good, upright, and moral. You too, friend, must be saved. Because no matter how moral or good you are, you don't measure up to the requirement of God. And the requirement of God is perfection. Do we have any perfect people in the house? Hey! No, you know, put no! No perfect people in the house. Because even if you made one mistake in your life, just one, that ruined perfection forever, <laughs> forever and ever. And theologically, we understand that we've all been born in sin. We're not only sinners because we sin, we're also sinners because we were born with a sinful nature. So therefore, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're separate from God. You must be saved. There is no other way around. And there are dangerous substitutes that infiltrate the church that would confuse you and Acts 15 was given to us, if they didn't answer this question properly, we would not be worshiping the same way today. They discerned the heart of God and got it right. 
consistent with the rest of the scriptures. What's the issue? Well, the issue is with the early churches, what do we do with all of these non-Jewish people that are responding to the gospel and now following Christ? Because you'll remember the church started where? In Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them on Pentecost, on that gathering of 120, and the church was born. Really, you could say it was born earlier when Jesus breathed on some of his disciples. But the church started in Jerusalem. And after the gospel left Jerusalem through persecution, it went through all the surrounding areas that were filled with non-Jews. The Bible word to describe non-Jews is Gentile. The gospel now is going throughout all the known world and the church is being filled with these Gentile believers. Understand, Gentile believers had no connection to Jerusalem, no desire to go to the temple. They didn't do anything with the sacrifices or the animals. They were outside of the covenant of God. For them to be now inside so quickly without doing anything observantly, This has stirred up the religious leaders. Notice what the issue is. Notice with me in verse five of Acts 15. This is the issue. The issue is some of the sect of the Pharisees, which would be the religious rulers of the day, who believed they're following Christ, they rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. What they're saying is, if the Gentiles want to be a part of the church, they need to get in line and have the foreskin of their privates physically cut off to be a part of the covenant. They need to go through this ritual that we had back in the old covenant. Now, fortunately, we don't have to do that today, so when you get to heaven, you go find Peter, James, uh, Paul, and Barnabas, and just thank them. Because if they got this wrong, instead of a prayer room after a service where people respond to the gospel like we had, we'd have a circumcision room. (laughs) Yes, just think, it would be horrible. But that is not what we have. We are saved by grace through faith. And you go, "Uh uh-huh, so I wanted you to laugh. I wanted to lighten it up again because while circumcision isn't the issue, you know what the issue is today? Water baptism. The same approach to salvation through works is often seen through water baptism. And there's a lot of confusion in the church today about water baptism. Those that teach wrong will tell you that you cannot be saved until you are water baptized. And the Bible couldn't be clearer that's not true. Couldn't be clearer. We'll clear it up a little bit in our text today. But the Bible couldn't be clearer. Only believers are water baptized. Water baptism is an outward expression of obedience of something that's already happened inside. So that if you would say, well, I want to be baptized, I want to be baptized, but I don't want anything to do with God. I just want to be baptized so I know that I'm going to heaven. Look, if you came to our services and one of our baptism services and you said that and you went into the water, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get wet. You're certainly not going to get saved. The Bible requires you to repent of your sins. The Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Water baptism comes to everyone that is saved. I mean, it happens all the time. I hear these testimonies all the time. I even experienced it in my own water baptism because of the family uh, that I was raised in the church they went to years ago, where you're, you're get, you go out to our summer baptism at the reservoir. You're so excited. Thousands of people are there. We're taking people under the water, one after another after another. You go back to work on Monday. You're so excited. You're telling all your friends, and, and you're, what'd you do this week? And I was baptized. Where? In the reservoir or what? And you'll hit that one person to go, you can't be baptized in Aurora water in the reservoir. No way. It doesn't work like that. You need to be baptized in our church with our water. And for some churches even with our ministers. Otherwise it doesn't count. Now, let me just say, if that person goes to a church in Aurora and they're baptizing in their sanctuary, guess where they're getting their water? From the reservoir. Please. I like to call nonsense on that kind of stuff. Because it's not special water and it's not special person. It's a special God. 
who has sent us on Jesus Christ to die for you. And circumcision and keeping the law is no longer required because of what Jesus Christ has done. And that's the key. And that's what they're going to be sharing here. And they do have a strong word. This is a strong word. Sometimes we need to stand strong for those things that matter. Pick up with me in verse 6 now. So the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. Let's pause there for a moment and recognize that this meeting, or what is commonly known as a church council, was convened to solve the matter between works and grace. Was Christianity to become another sect of Judaism? Or was it to be the free-flowing relationship with Messiah that was both prophesied and fulfilled with the coming of Jesus Christ? In this church council, I want you to notice in verse 6, that they gathered the leadership together to solve the problem. Only the spiritual leaders of the church came together to decide this matter. They did not call the general population of the church to come together. It was only the leaders. In the church government in Acts 15 was not congregational. And I know congregational leadership in churches is quite popular today, especially in the Western world, but it's foreign to the scriptures. It's foreign to the scriptures. It's more of a a Western democracy type of approach to church government, Um, but it's not biblical. It's not really found in the scriptures. What is found here at the biggest issue that the church has faced at this, they called the elders together and the apostles, and they hashed it out. The leaders gathered together, and they prayed and sought the mind of Jesus on this matter. In our time today, we're going to be looking at what Peter shares, but in the rest of Acts 15, we're going to have four key leaders share, if you're taking notes, which you can look for coming up ahead. Four key leaders are going to give their biblical assessment of this issue and their conclusion. The first one we're going to look at today is Peter. Peter's going to stand up, and he's going to give a viewpoint from the past, affirming a grace-based approach to the gospel, grace and faith. And he's going to undermine this idea of, hey, you got to be circumcised. you got to keep the law the rest of your life. No, no, no. He's going to look at the past, his own personal past, and he's going to affirm faith and grace. Then, in our next study, we're going to look at Paul and Barnabas. They're going to give a present assessment. And they're going to give a present assessment because they're in the middle of their missionary journeys. So they can just share, we were just here, we were just here, we were just here, we were just here. You will not believe what God is doing. And all without circumcision and all without the law. And then finally, James is going to step up. James is going to share his perspective, and he's going to look toward the future. He's going to give the direction which will be healthy for the future of the church, and we're grateful for these men. I also want you to notice before we get into this text who the leaders are and who they're not. Peter is not the key leader in the early church. Contrary to a very popular false teaching today, Peter was not the first pope. Neither was he ever a pope. The office of the pope is a man-made office. It is not a biblical office. It does not belong in the scriptures. Peter was not even the key number one leader here. Who was the key number one leader at this time? James from Jerusalem. And you have to be careful You have to be careful to take everything that you've ever learned and heard and compare it with the scriptures. Peter takes a subservient position. He's not writing new doctrine. He's not overseeing the church. He's not bossing people around. Not everybody's looking to him. He's just one voice among four key voices that are shared here. And from all appearances, James actually is the key leader of the church, but he doesn't even draw attention to himself for it. He just fills the role. Notice verse seven now. When there had been much dispute, much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, so it's like he silences the crowd, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts 
by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, one of the things you're going to learn in the inductive Bible study class when you take it is how to pay attention to context. So you see Peter here using a couple of different phrases that we need to determine who he's talking about. So the, notice in verse 7, he talks about God chose from among us that by my mouth the Gentile should hear the word of the Lord uh, of the gospel and believe. So there's a distinction between us, the Jews, and Gentiles. Specifically, Peter's talking about in verse 7 his, his own leadership, but then he broadens it. Notice in verse eight, so God who knows the heart acknowledged them, who would that be? Say it out loud, them, Gentiles. We know that by the context. So God acknowledging all these people getting saved, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, by giving them, who's that? Say it out loud. Uh, come on, you guys can do better than that. Them? Because people are listening. They're wondering, is anybody in the room? Is that by himself? They're listening from afar. So them by the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Who's that? The Jews. So you can see just something, learning something simple like that gives a depth of meaning to the text. He's, he's laying before them the issue, including themselves. But you have to remember, who is Peter? Peter's not just a leader, but ethnically, he's a Jew. And that matters, because the whole issue is dealing with the Gentiles. Now, remember this as well. We've studied this previously. But the Jewish people, many of them, had a very prejudicial racial uh, issue with the Gentiles, sinfully. Prejudice and racism is sin every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year, every year of the year of the year, forever and ever, okay? Racism is not from the Lord. It is selfishly sinful. And yet that's what they're dealing with. So part of the undertone of this is not just merely the religious manner of salvation, but it's who's getting saved. I can't, they're, they're shocked that compared to the Jewish response, the, the gospel is exploding throughout the Gentile world. So keep that in mind as well, that there's an issue of Jew versus Gentile that Peter is also addressing indirectly. Lots of dispute going on. Peter gets up and he says the first of four things. The first thing that he says to them is this, God called me to the Gentiles. That's what he says. He says, you guys know this, that a while ago God chose me, among, chose among us, me, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's basically giving a part of his testimony. And I know many times when we give our testimonies, it's kind of like what, where we were and all the things that we were into and what God saved us out of. And I know some of you, you know, you're challenged with your testimony. I mean, I wish you didn't have as bad a testimony as you have. I wish I didn't have as bad a testimony of all the bad, horrible decisions I made. But here's the thing. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You got a bright future. Your future is great in Christ. He's going to do new things. He's going to restore to you years that you threw away that you wasted he's going to restore your reputation he's going to restore your person like you just trust the lord don't worry about that you just trust the lord because look where you're at now you're not in sin anymore and i was thinking of that because i was just sharing my testimony you know that you need you need to be encouraged by sharing your testimony as hard as it might be because just last week i was sharing my testimony again and as i'm sharing it i'm going here and i'm going there and like the, the brother, was, he was so encouraged, but so was I. I'm like, man, I was bad. Yeah, this was horrible, but I'm not that anymore. I'm not that anymore. That's the work of God. And he was sitting across, I was sharing, he goes, man, you need to make this like a Netflix miniseries. <laughs> and I'm like, do you want to buy the rights to it? I'd love to, you know, like, like it's crazy. And, and I know even in my own memory, I don't remember as bad as it was. I know other people have perspectives that it was much worse than what I remember. 
but I get to stand here to affirm that God has delivered me from my past. You know, with the exception of my wife, with the exception of Marie, nobody really knows the old Ed here. Maybe Henry and Maria to some degree because I grew up with Maria, but like nobody really knows my past. The old Ed, he died in Southern California and the new Ed moved to Colorado and that's what we get to benefit from just like in your life. So sharing your testimony is important. Part of what Peter's saying here is God chose me to share, but you know, there's also, I think Peter's going, you guys know me, I'm just a fisherman. I'm just, I was just doing fine, fishing with my dad, making a good living, minding my own business, being an upright Jewish man, and then Jesus met me, and that wrecked my life. Forever in a day, it wrecked my sinful life and put me on the path of righteousness. He changed my life for the good. That changed me. And you know, guys, he says, not only did God save me, not only did I not choose this, it was chosen for me, but check this out. This little guy from Galilee, this fisherman, God told me that he's going to use my mouth. I mean, I think of some of you that have some of the foulest, dirtiest, nastiest, cussing mouths and minds that man has ever known. (laughs) To think that God wants to use that same mouth clean it up and use it for the gospel. Isn't that amazing? It's just unbelievable what God wants to do in your life if you yield to him and trust him. Don't worry about what people say. Don't worry about all the critics. Don't worry about people who want to remind you of your past. When people remind you of your past, you remind them of your future, of what God is doing in your life. You trust him. That's where Peter is, and no doubt he's got to be encouraged. He's given some theology here. He's giving some facts here, but inside he's like, man, this is amazing. I I mean, this is what God's done in my life. He told me to go with my mouth, and I did. I did go with my mouth, and it says that they heard the word of the gospel and believed. That's why I went. I took the word of the gospel, and many believed, and you remember Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. It started with Cornelius. It was where, like, he was probably shocked as anybody of what God was doing with Cornelius. Peter's the guy that had to get the vision, remember? Is the food coming down with the sheet? Uh, and what was that? Was it for the, all the animals and all the different animals and things that he, was that the purpose of the vision? No. What was the purpose? You remember what God said? It was basically this. And Peter's giving it right now. Hey, Peter, you got to understand something. If you and I are going to make it, you got to understand, if you're going to be used greatly, you got to get this. This is so important to you because of what's up ahead, right? Because everything you're going through right now, God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. So he gets the vision, and what was the summary? Remember the summary? God said it as clear as day. What God has called clean, don't you call unclean. That was the essence. Peter, I'm going to show you some incredible stuff, and you're going to wrestle with it because it's not what you're used to. It's not what's normal for you. You're immediately going to think unclean, unclean. But I'm telling you right now, I can clean the unclean. I'm telling you, and that's where Peter is here. So it's got to be so encouraging for him. Notice in verse 8, it says, So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them. Who is them? Gentiles. And this them is a particular Gentiles that heard the gospel and believed. God acknowledged them. Why? Because he knows the heart. He knows the heart. Notice, it says, God who knows the heart acknowledged them, how? By giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. They had their own little mini Pentecost. It was visible, it was audible, it was recognizable. It was an affirmation of God knowing their hearts, that God was working in the Gentile world because the Jews had rejected him, almost wholesale. So the second thing he says is that the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles just like the Jews. We don't need, they they weren't circumcised. None of these guys cared about the law when I showed up. But I'll tell you what, they I preached to them, they believed, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them. How can you argue with that? God is at work. However, there are still people that love to argue. They they think they know your heart, but only God knows your heart. Sometimes you even wonder, you even you know question your own salvation at times because you don't even know your heart. But when you don't know your heart, you don't understand, you're starting to question. Here's, here, I want to help you with that. You're starting to question your salvation or question whether it's real or whether it took or any of that. You start looking for the fruit of the Spirit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit. The, what, what is God doing through you? You may not feel it. You may not see it, but you can look for it. 
The fruit of the Spirit, what are those, Ed? Well, let me share them with you. You should memorize them, Galatians chapter 5. But here they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Those are from the Lord. Those that God has acknowledged by knowing your heart, the heart that believes, he fills you with his Holy Spirit. And in that spiritual relationship, those attributes and more start appearing in your life. And you know what's the most dramatic and most shocking is the ones that you never, ever experienced before in your life. Like I think perhaps some of you may be a harsh person before you got saved, but now you're one of the kindest, most gentlest people that's tripping people out that were close to you. Why? Because God knows your heart and he's changing you from the inside out. You're not harsh anymore. You are now gentle. And you're, you're, you're living such a life that's honoring God because he lives in you. God knows your heart. Amen. You have to be careful because when you start sharing your testimony, people will start arguing with you and like, no, you're stuck to your past. No, no, on and on. Like, and, and you can just, you can just like, if you have to, you can just look at them and go, bro, you don't know my heart, man. Like, you're, not, you're talking so far from reality. My heart, God has affirmed my love for him. You know, because other people are like water baptism, they'll get upset when they hear you might respond to the gospel today, and which will be glorious. We want you. We've been praying for you. We want you to do that. I'm going to give you an invitation in just a few moments from Jesus himself to follow him. You respond to the gospel. Then you start telling people, and they'll go, well, how'd that happen? They go, well, I don't know. Some dude invited me to church. I was sitting in the back. Uh, this guy up there talking, he's moving around a lot. He told me about the love of God. He invited me to follow Jesus. I'm like, I want to follow Jesus. Look at my life. I want to turn from my sin. And I did what they asked me to do. And I'm going to follow God the rest of my life. And the response is, you can't do it that way. I'm like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What do you mean I can't do it that way? What, what's the way to do it? Well, then let me show you. And then they've got all these things that you have to do. And then once you finish them all and take a test, if you get a C++, you're in. <laughs> and you just got to remind people, hey, look, God, he's searching the hearts right now. Whether you raise your hand, whether you stand, whether you walk the aisle, whether you walk out to the parking lot and pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins in your car, the methodology doesn't matter. You know what matters? The heart. Amen. Every single week I share this scripture with you without fail almost every single week. It's such an important scripture that even for the guest teachers, we have it printed right here on the pulpit. It's right here. In case I ever forget, it always catches my eye when I stand in this pulpit. And this, I'll read it to you verbatim right here. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe where? In your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... One believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Amen. That is the truth of God's word for you. And the heart, I don't want you to think of it just as your pumping muscle in your chest, but rather the Greeks and the Hebrews in the first century would understand the heart as the sum of who you are. Do you know, we even use a little bit of that phrase today, right? When you put your heart into it. What are you trying to describe, man? You're all in. You put your heart into it. You're a teacher at school, you put your heart into it. You're a mom or a dad, you put your heart into it. In your singleness, honoring the Lord, you put your heart into it. What are you trying to say? This is who I am. I want to please the Lord. I want to give it my all. And God knows your heart, even if everyone around you doesn't. And even sometimes we don't even know our own hearts, man. We just got to cry out, God, search me and know me and reveal my heart because I thought my motives were right. I thought, but God, he knows who we are. He knows that we're just human. He knows that you're in a certain stage of your spiritual growth and your maturity. He knows you. And you know what's so beautiful about the knowledge of God? He knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. And he still loves you. <laughs> he doesn't abandon you. He doesn't walk away from you. It's so good. So Peter says the Holy Spirit was given to him. The third thing he says in verse 9 is that he made no distinction between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, purifying their, the Gentiles' hearts by faith. 
God's work among the Gentiles is happening without the ritualistic rules or without the obligations and certainly without circumcision. It was happening, you know, for the Jewish boy born into a Jewish home, he was circumcised within a few days. And so then you could attribute, well, he's a part of the covenant, and so all these good things are happening because he was a part of the covenant. For the Gentiles, not one of them are circumcised. Not one of them have a copy of the law. Not one of them have been in synagogue. Not one of them have gone to the temple. They don't care. But when they hear the gospel, they're transformed just like all those that had a head start on them, the Jews. And the third thing that Peter says is that God is no respecter of persons. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Again, the clarity of God's heart against racism and prejudice to prejudge someone by the color of their skin or by the language or by their status or where they came from or what they look like or a thousand different ways that man has invented to divide men from men, women from women. God doesn't, he's not a respecter of persons. He loves you as the human being that you are. He created you in his image. And it's unfortunate the damage that we've done to one another through treating each other. You know, as we learned a few years ago uh, from our friend Miles McPherson, you know, the Bible says that we're to love our neighbor. But what we do internally, whether consciously or subconsciously, he taught us, what we do is we create different labels for people instead of neighbor. So if we can label you something other than a neighbor, then something kicks in in us that we don't have to love you. But you remember they asked the question who, to Jesus, who is our neighbor? And Jesus said, everyone. Everyone. God is no respecter of persons. That's a good news not only on the racial prejudice line, but it's also good news for everyone you're praying for right now. God is no respecter of persons. As bad as your mom is, God wants to reach her. And as bad as your son might be right now, God wants to reach him. And that new boss that came in that's just flipping everything upside down at work, God wants to reach him. He wants to reach your dad and your mom and your brother and your sister and your friend and your neighbor. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. (laughs) And of whom Paul would say, I'm a chief, but we all are. And there is no respecter of persons. Peter is clear and consistent. He learned this with the vision. He learned this with Cornelius. Remember, in Acts chapter 10, in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Romans chapter three, verse nine, Paul would say this. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have all previously charged that both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, that we are all under sin. And the fourth thing that Peter shares is his conclusion. Notice in verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What is the yoke? Circumcision and putting them back under legalism, taking them back. Legalism, the word comes from law. It's the idea of requiring people certain behaviors in order to be saved. Another way we try to explain that is in our relationship with God, we are not saved or kept saved by our good works. We are simply saved for good works. So there will be change in our life, But that's not what keeps us changed. That's not what keeps us in relationship. We are not saved by our works, but rather we are saved by the finished singular work of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, buried, and rose again. So the yoke here is an interesting description. Why do you want to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Don't miss this. It's it's Peter saying a lot in a little bit of space. But who, what is he calling all of the Gentiles that responded to the gospel? Disciples. <laughs> what is a disciple but a learner or a follower of Christ? You know what Peter just did with all the folks getting saved in the first century? He's putting them in the same category as you. You're a disciple in the 21st century. And you all came different ways. Fighting different battles. Different paths. But you know, God's no respecter of persons. You hear the gospel, you believe, he'll give you new life. 
He'll indwell you with his Holy Spirit. He'll baptize you with his power. And the last thing you need today is for me as a pastor and leader to place some heavy yoke on you. Now, for some of you that are new to the Bible, you might be thinking right now, what in the world does an egg have to do with the gospel? So I'm not saying yolk like an egg. This is a yoke, Y-O-K-E. It's a very important illustration. You gotta remember, the first century believers, this was an agrarian society. So you'll find that a lot of the illustrations that are used, a lot of the descriptions are used for farmers, for those that are working on farms and and tilling the land. And a yoke was a large wooden uh, contraption with a circle on it, that sometimes two circles, that they would connect two oxen together to work together. So if they put them together in the yoke, then they would be able to have two animals as strong and get the work done faster. That's why, by the way, for you single folks, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And the idea is if you connect yourself with unbelievers, it will hinder your progress and it's forbidden by God. So that's the picture. The picture is it's a heavy wooden contraption that would go on your shoulders, go on the shoulders of an animal. So Peter's like, why are you guys wanting to put heavy things on the shoulders of these new believers? Don't do that. Don't put a heaviness on these disciples when you yourselves aren't even doing it, when you yourselves are not even following it. You know, this is what, this, this in, you know, I would say this, the law had become an intolerable burden upon the people. Jesus would often come up against the religious rulers in their attempt to add further burdens to the people. It still happens today. Jesus is most upset with religious charlatans that are taking advantage of his sheep by burdening their lives with rules and regulations. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 23. The whole chapter is relevant to this, but I just want to read a couple of verses. Turn back now to Matthew 23 as we wind down into this time of remembering the Lord through communion. Notice Matthew 23. The final thing that Peter says is that through grace, God has removed the yoke of bondage from around the Jew's neck, from around anyone's neck, and don't put it back on. Don't put it back on yourself. Don't let some new thing on YouTube put it back on you. Don't let some teacher put it back on you. Don't let some movement, you know, there's movements today, messianic movements that want to put people back under the law. Don't let them do it. It's right here in Acts 15. Couldn't be clearer, couldn't be clearer. A child can understand this, that if you believe in Jesus, you can follow him and he will lead you. You can trust him. He'll lead you in life. Notice what Jesus said to the religious leaders. Verse three, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do it, but don't do according to their works for they say and do not do. By the way, that's a good definition of hypocrisy. They say, but they don't do what they say. Verse four, For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men, and they want the best places at the feast, verse 6. They want the greetings, verse 7, of rabbi, rabbi, and it's all a sham. And that's what Peter's saying here. Grace has released you. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. It has served its purpose. What was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law, Galatians tells us, it was a tutor. And what did it teach us? It taught us that we needed forgiveness. I use the same illustration all the time, but it happens to be extremely relevant in our church, the speed limit sign. When you're driving here and you see the speed limit sign, and you compare that number with the number on your dashboard, that sign's telling you something. Of course, if the number is higher on the speed limit sign than your speedometer, we're the car behind you hoping you'll speed up. (laughs) It's like, come on, you can go faster, it's okay. Your number's higher. But if the speedometer is higher than the speed limit sign and you see it, the sign says one thing to you. You have broken the law. 
you are a lawbreaker. That's all it says. It can't jump into your car and stop you, slow you down. It can't chase you down the street and hit you on the back. Slow down, slow down. It just merely is telling you, you have broken the law. It has done its job. It is there to limit you, but when you go beyond its limits, it is there to reveal to you that you're a lawbreaker. And that's all it can do. And then once you pass it, it's served its purpose. Because if you don't pay attention to the signs, eventually someone will come alongside of you and help you pay attention to the signs. Red, blue flashing lights, pull over, sign right here. And what is that officer doing but enforcing what the sign said to you that you already know to be true? Check this out. Some of you, even when somebody comes to the door, when an officer comes to the door, but, 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 but officer, I thought I could go five miles above the number. That's what you thought. Sign here. Because <laughs> that's all the law can do. With the law in the Old Testament, the Bible, using that same illustration, what the law did is revealed to all of us that we've all sinned. Amen. It can't change us. It can't get inside of us. It only drives us, it tutors us to call out to God who can save us. And once you call out to God by grace, you are forgiven. No longer do you need the law. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled the law. By faith in Jesus Christ, you fulfill the law through him. When you abide in Christ, that is the safest place for you to be on the planet Earth. Be careful of these yokes. Don't let anybody lay a heavy trip on you. I don't want you to think that you have permission to run wild and sin all you want. The wages of sin is always death. You'll pay a price for it. Remember, you know that God acknowledges your heart when you see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Not this sense of, well, you know, I'm saved, but I can still be the same horrible person I've always been. That's not saved. That's like saying, you know, moving into a new house, you got a new address, but you go home to the old address all the time, and there's already a new family living there, and you're like, hey, hey, what are you doing, man? I, hey, I, we live here now. No, no, no. I, I live over there, but I still live here. It's dumb. It doesn't make any sense, but people live their life the same way. They're in and out of church, in and out of church, in and out of church. They might even buy a Bible, but never surrender their life to Jesus Christ, and they're still acting the same way, still sounding the same way. But now every once in a while, you know, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You need to be born again. That's the word of the Lord. You must be born again. There is no other way. You're going to live a frustrating life the rest of your life unless you're born again. So let's talk about this yoke real quick here before we end and we remember the Lord. Because it's a great picture. While the law became an intolerable burden, we have an invitation from Jesus. Very familiar. So familiar we might miss it. But you'll remember in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said this. He said, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And isn't that what you're looking for? True rest? Like you don't have to play this game and work this and manipulate this and make this and try to work. Because it doesn't work. It's not working for you. And it's just exhausting you. And, you know, you might get this solved over here and there's 10 other things over here and you're not rest, resting at all. You're not experiencing the peace of God. And so what does Jesus say? You want that? You come to me. He doesn't say come to the law. He doesn't say come to the synagogue. He doesn't say come to the church. He says, come to me. All you that are burdened today. And I mean, I think about why people come into church. They come, in, they come into churches like ours all the time for a lot of different reasons but I'm speaking specifically to the ones that you're here today because the burdens of life have weighed you down. They're heavy and they're hard. And you're like, well, maybe that guy keeps inviting me to church and I'll come and I'll, I'll visit, but I won't tell anybody. I'll just sit in the back and here you are, reminded of God's love once again and hearing the words of Jesus, come to me. And then he says something interesting. You'll never, you'll never remember this verse the same way after this teaching today. You know why? This is what Jesus says. He says, take my yoke, take my yoke upon you. Peter's saying, don't put a yoke of bondage on people that are so heavy. And Jesus is saying, if you are going to take a yoke, you take mine. What does he say? 
He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. By the way, you're looking for things that magnify that you are a saved person. You'll start sounding like Jesus, and you don't even mean to. That's what Peter's doing. He's using the same illustrations. Where did he learn that illustration from? Jesus. It's the back end of what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 11. So I have the privilege of inviting you today to come to Jesus. That you might have your sins forgiven by the blood that he shed for you. You're going to see in a moment this whole church room participate in something known as communion. Where we are told by Jesus to remember his broken body and the blood that was shed for us. Today Jesus is inviting you to take of his body, to take of the blood that was shed for you so that your forgiveness might be secure in him. And so, Lord, we come to an end of a very beautiful section of scripture. Thank you for Peter. He encourages all of us with a testimony to see how you've used this man. This was the man that failed greatly. This is the man who was always ahead of the game. This was the man who said things he wished he never said. This was the man that we may have thought never will change. We thank you for Peter because he is the man you've chosen to use. And we pray, God, that today, as we prepare our hearts for communion, that truly we would remember you and not forget all the great things you have done and are continuing to do in our lives. For some, you save marriages here. For some, you saved literal lives. For some, you added years to their life by removing sin. For some, you gave a sound mind. You healed their body. For some, you, uh, you know, man, so much to be said. And we thank you for that today, God. Now, as the church is praying, you guys that are here, keep praying for those that are listening to me because I want to extend the invitation of Jesus to those that need it. Jesus is inviting you to himself. Not only, not only is salvation through Jesus, but remember, you must be saved. So I want to invite you here today, if you want the forgiveness of your sins, like for the very first time, like you've never done this before, you want to acknowledge it publicly, you want to follow Jesus with your life, would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you. I want to help you do what we read. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the belief that you have right now in your heart. I want to help you with that. And I'm inviting you to respond publicly right where you are. God bless you right here in the front. Those of you that respond, you're going to have pastors come up alongside of you. So don't be startled by them. Uh, They're coming up to help you. God bless you in the back. Who else would say that's me? You guys right here in the middle? You guys online? uh, Listening on the radio for sure? You're not forgotten? You guys right here, so good. Right here up front. We're gonna run out of pastors here pretty soon. So if you're a leader in this church, you get up and I want you to walk by some, we got folks over here, we got a young lady here, a couple over here. I want you um, to help. We'll wait for you. Thank you, Matt, Everett, Sergio. So good. What's up, brother? You want to reaffirm? I know you're already born again. The Lord's working in your heart, huh? It's so good. Somebody, a brother, can put, come up and lay hands on him? Thanks, Matt. Back in the back over here. It's an outpouring of the Spirit of God today. A work of His Spirit. Everett's heading over there. The Lord is working. So I want to help you. It's worth the wait. Just ask God to forgive you. It's what we call prayer. You can say this. You can talk like this. And you can repeat after me if you like. But you can use your own words. But you say something like, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe you sent your only begotten son to live for me. To die for me. And I believe he rose again from the dead to save my soul. 
I turn away and repent of my sins. And I ask you to forgive me and help me follow you all the days of my life. And Father, I pray those near and far that truly you're just working in their hearts right now. It's a, a special, special day. Special work of your spirit. We pray it's real, legitimate, and lasting in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.